Welcome to another episode of the Coffee Roaster Warm Up Sessions podcast. Hopefully everybody is doing quite dandy. Uh, hopefully everybody's staying warm. It is freezing, folks, in the Pacific Northwest. Getting hit with some uh, single-digit temps. Yeah. Uh, makes for treacherous roasting conditions. Um, makes for just treacherous driving conditions. So hopefully everybody's staying safe. I'm sure... I'm, from what I hear, it's happening across the country, everywhere. I think the there's some kind of desert in California that got snow for the first time. Hmm. It's been um, like 42 years. That's insane. I haven't heard that. I heard that Florida also is getting pretty cold, but I also don't. I just heard hearsay. Just wild. Anyways, let's pour some batchy. Um The brew is pretty solid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was great. It's nice. Um, man. I don't know if I have uh, many thoughts because it's... It, this is a type of coffee that could be a daily driver. Yeah. It has enough intrigue to where it's fun to drink. Yes. But it's not insane where it's uh, overwhelming to drink there's something to say for a coffee that's exactly that mm -hmm. like i'm a huge fan of that i um if i can find something that's like really solid in yeah. flavor it's just you know it has complex it has nuance it has intrigue it's sweet and it just hits the spot without being too insane in one way or another it, it just goes down easily yeah i'll i'll have some breakfast to this i'll have this as you know just on the go i'll this is great and i'm sure this would slap on filter on espresso mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um yeah yeah uh i believe our buddy nate would enjoy this coffee nathaniel from who Robert. Wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know, dude. <laughs> As a daily driver. Oh, did he know. one time say that his favorite origin is like what? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Nathaniel, maybe I'm I, I, I wish you were here. I yeah. wish you were the third person on this podcast so you can tell us, mm. would you like this? Would you, would you enjoy this? But I think we were talking about like coffees that are daily drivers. And this is kind of... Yeah. I think up his alley. But this I is also a natural, right? An aerobic natural. Yeah. And it tastes nothing like it. Yeah. And that makes me happy. Yeah. That makes me happy. Um, I don't know. I'm getting some like, I know I, I, I always say this. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe coffees always taste like this. But I'm getting some stone fruit. <laughs> some like dark, yeah. dark, like dark yeah, fruit. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I'm getting dried fruit. Dark fruit yeah. and getting some orange, I think. Yes, is the is the br is the brighter acidity that's kind of sweet. I don't I don't know. You know, I w we tasted that honey on this coffee mm -hmm. last time we had this, mm -hmm. which I actually thought was very pleasing. Um, but I'm not really picking up much. Yeah, that in it's here. not it's not the same sweetness like it was. It's definitely more of a uh, darker fruit sweetness. Not exactly a plum. But the, um yeah, actually the more the more it cools, the more I'm letting it linger in my mouth, the more I actually think it still has that honey in there. I was actually getting that one time we got honey, I was actually getting some black tea on it. Mm -hmm. And this might be crazy because it's crazy to think that this is a Guatemalan anaerobic natural and I'm picking up black tea. Mm -hmm. But um it's kind of like lingering, like it sometimes comes and goes in your mm -hmm. mouth almost, kind of more towards the back end on kind of closer to the aftertaste, but not quite. Yeah. Um, like a hint of floral-esque something going I on. I was going to say floral. But it's not I floral. Just, I didn't want to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to be like, oh, floral. Name all yeah. the coffee notes. No. And yeah. you're going to get one. 
right, you know, someday. Hmm. I mean, this coffee is pretty complex. I think especially for uh, anaerobic coffee, which a lot of the times I think anaerobic co- coffees are so punchy on the front end. Yes. A lot of these big berry flavors, and then they kind of die out with just maybe a classic sweetness, which mm-hmm. isn't bad. They have their place for that. Yeah. Uh, but they sometimes lack a lot of the nuance or complexity and experience. Yes. And I and think this sip, I'm just like tasting new stuff. I I mean, I was going to say the same thing. When, like right now, I keep coming back and I'm mm-hmm. trying to sip on it more and trying to, trying to like think about what it tastes like. Mm-hmm. To me, that's intriguing. Yeah. To me, that's an intriguing coffee where I'm just going back, sip over sip, all of a sudden your cup's empty. Like that to me is like signs of an enjoyable coffee for me. Um, and for those of you wondering, uh, what are we just sipping on? We're sipping on a Guatemalan anaerobic natural. Um, yeah. Um, and this coffee, uh, our friends at Onyx Coffee, mm-hmm. uh, coffee importers, they gave us a very small amount to roast up because they were going to send off some gifts to their to roasters um, around the country that they've worked with. And I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this, but I think I am. I mean, either <laughs> way, they're going to receive those yeah, gifts. At some point. Uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, and so th- these are just a little bit of um, some coffees we took just to taste in QC. And we're going to talk a little bit about this more later down in, in today's mm. episode. But um, it was a very small amount of coffee. It was an anaerobic natural from Guatemala that we needed to dial in in a short amount of time. We actually we had we less had than short, seven day turnaround. We had limited limited green to work with, mm-hmm. a short amount of time to turn around, and um, and some other challenges along the way that we kind of had to work around. I I think this I think talking about that later on in the podcast, um, I think is going to be helpful to some people. Yeah, uh, because I think especially with really high end coffees, you don't always have. Um, you know, a thousand pounds, 4,000, 5,000 pounds of mm-hmm. it just laying around. Um, oftentimes it's like, well, that's the lot and that's, that's the lot, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, but anyway, but, uh, this is airing, I think a day or two before Christmas. Mm-hmm. Uh, Serge, what, what would you hope to receive this Christmas holiday coffee gear wise? Yeah. Or maybe not. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one now you're opening up a whole different can of worms i think uh coffee stuff man um you know man a few things are coming to my mind where do i start i think one of the things like definitely a new pitcher for pouring latte art didn't you get like three pitchers just yes now? that's that was going to be my point <laughs> uh there's never a lack of having a different colorway it's almost like a sneaker collection um, you need a new colorway. Morgan drinks coffee. Colorway right now is dropping. Morgan Eckroth. Is that how you pronounce her last name? Eckroth? Or something so. like that. Um, dropped a new colorway, which is great. Pairs very nicely with my pink. It's great. But I was thinking also, like, if I had the possibility of that, I would probably get the black one. Because a black, kind of the slate, concrete looking one, and then a, like, light pink one. That colorway on bar look fun um so that's that you know that that's kind of unnecessary gift with that also like i could always use some lino cappuccino cups from not neutral the good six ounces maybe a five ouncer those are always great these are like little things that kind of mean a lot actually the funny thing is slow pour supply just dropped my dream mug that i've always wanted to and i did not cop it uh the pink six ounce uh, forget the brand, but it's at slow pour supply, and I've been wanting that cup, but it's forty bucks. Oh, I was just, with a saucer, I was just like, ugh, just not could not. I already have That's so many, yeah. and it's probably not gonna be like my mug. I like to pour in competition. <laughs> I only pour the same mug in every comp, so yeah, it was not justifiable, you know. So yeah. I think those are the two little things that definitely. Fair enough. I think. I think. You know, I, I'm not a huge mug guy. I'm not. However, um, you know, when somebody gets me a Hasami mug, 
I'm I'm all for it. I'm yeah. like, please give me another one. Buy me three. Buy me four. Buy me ten. Buy me a whole set. I don't know. Like they're just, you know, there's been multiple people on the podcast who have listened to the podcast who have went and bought mm-hmm. a Sami mug just because we've raved about it. But wow, this is just an, a work of art. Like, give me a a six ounce or a twelve ounce or a twenty four mm-hmm. ounce. Give me all the ounces <laughs> yeah. that they have. It's just the work of art. It's beautiful. They're great. They're they're so comfortable to drink yeah. out of. It's just it's craftsmanship. They're not they don't cost an arm and a leg. Mm-hmm. Like I bought this for I think like it's like 15, 16 bucks or something. Of course yeah. it was like kind of on sale. Yeah. But but yeah, I think I think it's like it's beautiful where it doesn't look cheap and mm-hmm. I think somebody But I it's mean, simple. It's yeah. Yeah. It, maybe I'm just basing this off yeah. of myself, but wow, this would be extravagant to receive. You know, it's just it's just interesting enough for it to be like, oh no, you didn't just buy yeah. me a freaking diner mug. Yeah. You know, this is there's some thought going into this. Yeah. So. I, I mean, I I love those as well. I mean, serving them in the cafe is great, but I'm still <laughs> fully fascinated and completely enjoy drinking out of glass. Uh, I mean, this isn't the best representation if y'all are watching. It's David's tea, double-walled. There's something about the element of a double-walled glass that I love. I was actually, speaking of that, was looking at the crew that every single person has on IG. Same, same. I was looking uh, at them, was again going to cop the the duo. It's so pricey, and the... I have a tendency of breaking glass. I've I've had four or five fellow tasters, yes. and I don't own one anymore. That's why I got the David's Tea one because it's so cheap. Uh, yeah, I was just like, I can't I can't afford to break another glass. Um, plus, I'll be honest, this is a hot take. I don't absolutely love the design of Kruv. Yeah, depending on the they they have like this funky like the shape. Yeah, the yeah. shape. Yeah, well, how, you know, as much as I'm not. I don't know if this I is like a, like a like a marketing thing that I don't know they did or some or what what it is but wow I was looking at them exact me too I I, I stumbled across some content that was featuring yeah. them and I'm like man maybe it's time to just buy one like maybe it's time yeah. to just cave in What about their carafes? I can't do the carafes. No. Those look like something in between like a science beaker and futuristic like Something you'd see yeah, in the UFO in Predator or, or something. Yeah, yeah. But something you know spooky. what always comes to my mind, and <laughs> no. this is a very, very deep one, deep dive here, is uh, I feel like I should be on set of the Ten Commandments with Charleston Heston, right where they're at the Pharaoh's Lounge. Yeah, they're yeah, pouring yeah. Wine. Some, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds oh, about man. right. Too far. Yeah, I, yeah, I've I've definitely been considering them, but yeah, they 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 are on the on the pricier side, yeah. but. Um, that's I mean, mugs were great. The not neutral cups are also really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why I just don't really like the glass ones, the I'm I'm over the kind of over the double wall glass. Like I like it, but man, it gets dirty. Yeah, it gets sure. like the fingerprints on it. It it just I don't know. Yeah, it's unless it's like perfectly clean and mm-hmm. sits perfectly unused. Um, other than that. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. I, I think another thing is like I could always use another uh, WDT tool. Oh yeah, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I, I'm jealous of yours. Yours is so long and like it's like tall. The needles. It would be much easier for me to use something like you have on my Tricolet, where my Normcore one. Everyone knows Normcore. It's like bottom of the food chain. Sorry, Normcore. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Hopefully, from no one from no one is listening. Yeah. Come on, uh, that was that was brutal. Okay, <laughs> but, I, but I, by bottom of the food chain, let, let me rephrase that. I was referring to the price tag. They're the least expensive ones, right? Am I right or am I right or am they're, I wrong? Let's just see, folks. They're, tell they're, me, they're on the budget. End. On the budget. End. I mean, which you is, either which want is, a pair a of paper clips or you want the Normcore one. <laughs> I still go with the Normcore hey, one. Listen. For, to be fair, I have a Normcore, you know, porta filter. For those of you watching, you'll see like a Breville dual boiler in the corner there. I I have the Normcore porta filter. Am I happy with it? No, but it it works. It I also have a knockoff done. Time War scale. Am I happy with it? <laughs> no, no but not. it works. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was oh, on eBay God. for nine ninety nine. No, you guys. This- <laughs> 
<laughs> that's my, uh, it's it's not even a time war. It's just it's, it's like the off. it's it's the knockoff unbranded one. Yeah, I mean, folks, you gotta see this, dude. <laughs> you guys. Oh god. I mean, honestly, let me to those who this is you know a uh, audio, not a visual uh, platform. But I'll tell you when the on and off tag is so big, you know there was a lack of design. Like it's that doesn't massive. need to be large. Like that's like. It's like a one inch. Does that, I mean, when when the font is so simple and all it says is mini smart scale, I mean, you should be concerned. But, but it kind of works. Listen, it gives it gives you know the Kai, cute. the yeah. the pearl the or the Kai Lunar a run for its money. Are yeah, you kidding me. This is about 20, 20 times as uh, or two hundred ninety twenty times more affordable. I'm a hundred percent. But it weighs yeah. the espresso. I've been yeah. pulling espresso shots with it and it works yeah. great. I mean, I don't mind Except buying a new one every month. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is perfect for like, you know, tossing it in my backpack with my like arrow press and go up and to maybe the, the flare and go watch there some eagles is. and pour some espresso yeah. like like this Christmas morning. Yeah. This year's exactly. Christmas morning. Um yeah, I think uh yeah, it's a interesting little little scale it just doesn't tear unfortunately really <laughs> to tear you have to you have to turn it off and what? on oh there it is or maybe i i haven't read the manual there's the t button and same thing with the power you know oh that's smart design you see how they have the on and off button usually well usually it's a dash that's actually the letter t oh that's fair for tear. i just don't know how to use that well it's not tearing yeah it's not tearing well folks i'll tell you what that's how things work. Can, Can you, you triple click it? it? Oh. oh, one, two milliliters. Ooh, there. Whoa, these functions. I like it. Anyways, uh, I don't know. Folks, anyway, anyway, fun uh, stuff. yeah. Um, yeah, that I, speaking of WDT tools, I'm so happy I went with the barista hustle. It, it's, it's $10 more expensive. I get it than yeah. all the Etsy ones. But wow, what I loved is you get replacement needles. Mm -hmm. you, I have a whole stack of them. Mm -hmm. So if one breaks, you just replace it. It's got the way it's designed with the holes is you can actually change your configuration. I don't know why you would, yeah. but I, I like yeah. that modularity. The way the fact that you can take it out and in very yeah. easily, it just it just works really well. It feels really nice in your hands. I I'm a huge fan. But that it was a great piece of to, uh, piece of gear that I probably one of my favorites. I actually took my espresso from like seventy five to hundred. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of them. I was spe skeptical, but wow! All you need is a little funnel, and you're good to go. That's right. I need one of those magnetic yeah. funnels. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, those Anyways. are the little things. Uh, anything large, like big item. I I'd love I I mean I would never be mad if somebody you know snuck a nice little EK forty three ass under the tree, <laughs> you know <laughs> just uh, make sure just yeah. it, don't take off the hopper so you don't give it away <laughs> just <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> and just wrap yeah. it like completely like in the shape of the EK so you're yeah, like totally. hmm, what is that yeah, <laughs> There's totally. only one thing it could be either a, a either a giant ode or a. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or a ek or it's one of the other uh budget grinders that is in the shape of the ek <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 all right folks yeah. yeah um anyways uh that being said trees and christmas um merry christmas happy holidays uh i know this is airing two days before um before uh christmas and uh hopefully you guys have a delightful delightful mm -hmm. time this weekend um but anyways we talked about this Onyx coffee, which I'm going to pour myself some more. Um, so we were given a task of roasting the, this coffee. We had, what we, what we asked for was two, two 12 pound dial in batches mm -hmm. and the rest of it needed to be roasted, um, seven day, within a seven day turnaround. And that's challenging yeah. because realistically when you've roasted a batch, you need at least a day, at least a day, 24 hours, or if not two would be better mm -hmm. to cup. And then you need to come back and roast it again. Um, and so just that already mm -hmm. leaves you at five days, yeah. three, four days, four, five days. 
Um, and so you, there's very little time. And so the the scary thing also is like with limited time, limited amount of green. How do you dial in a new coffee you've never roasted when mm-hmm. um, and you need it? You need it to taste pretty good, pretty decent. Yep. Um, doesn't have to be like mind boggling, but it has to be fairly good and in, in the ballpark. Yep. Uh, how do you do that? Especially when there's nuance where coffee could crash after mm-hmm. crack. That's a huge problem yeah. that, you know, you kind of have to deal with. Um, what happens when there's just interesting, unexpected things that come yeah. up? And so Serge, give us a little glimpse of like how, what were the first things that we thought about and we went to right away um, to start this process? Yeah. Uh, as far as I remember, one of the first things we talked about was batch size. Mm-hmm. Um, because there, there's a few reasons. One is efficiency. Um, where does this fit in our roast date? Because we still have to do all of our production roasts. We still have to fulfill orders. Right. And then we need to crank out this uh, this uh, coffee in a very short period of time. Um, and then also understanding like how much coffee we have divided by how many roasts it's going to take. Mm-hmm. So batch size uh, matters quite a bit. Um, within that, also understanding that Man, if we choose a bigger batch size, we have limited amount of roasts for dial-in. Um, and right. that can get pretty risky. So we went from, you know, talking about three different numbers of like, okay, do we want to do this, that? How do we, where do we meet in the middle? Mm-hmm. And um, what if something goes wrong? And I think even before all of that, like for folks to bring clarity, like this is a coffee we've never uh, brewed we've never cupped we've never tasted yeah we don't know anything about this coffee apart from the information that was given to us mm-hmm. um so we were very new um we all we knew and had an idea of like okay these are the areas that we struggle with with anaerobic coffee so yeah. how do we prepare uh the roast for right. those kind of struggles like the tendencies that anaerobic coffees have um so we have to process that mm-hmm. and then finally um just creating a plan because we knew like, Hey, at this date, our client, or I think one of the final things I wanted to bring up is the fact is we weren't roasting this coffee for us. Yes. This isn't our coffee. Like, uh, we don't get to, uh, basically, um, you know, if something goes wrong, we don't get to like deal with that. The stakes are much higher when you're doing it for someone, someone else. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with, messing something up for myself even mm-hmm. though i don't want to do that Get the cost be yeah done. yeah but when it's for somebody else yeah definitely the stakes are much higher um and so yeah i think i think i think uh figuring out batch size um and then we cupped it on ikawa roast we did right. a small little sample roast just to get a feel as to man what's this coffee has got to offer yep. uh what are we playing with here um and then also taking into consideration um all the other coffees that we've roasted from Guatemala. So, um, you know, some of some of our unreleased coffees that we have yet to release um, are some Guatemalans. Um, and kind of taking, utilizing all of our past roast, all the data and information that we have already to yes. work with. Yeah. How can we utilize what's already proven to work mm-hmm. in this new approach to this brand new coffee yeah. um and that can get you a far way it won't get you all the way mm-hmm. but that can get you a leading direction um towards what you should be doing with this coffee and after all a lot of coffees you're going to be approaching in the very same way yeah. um and not say that all coffees roast the same but you're kind of approaching it with the same kind of almost general system, mm-hmm. whether that's, you know, your between batch protocol, whether that's um, how you go down in your gas setting. Yeah. What are you prioritizing? What, you know, um, <laughs> all like roasting to color also. Yeah. Like the crazy thing is like you and I, when we were dialing in this coffee, we dialed it in and then check the color on it through our small little color reader and we usually like coffees of a particular color. Yeah, and within it, two numbers. Yeah. yeah. And whenever we are like, yeah, I think this is pretty close to what mm-hmm. we'd, well, where we want this coffee to sit, cupping wise, mm-hmm. we went and checked it on the reader and it was nearly spot on. Yeah. So, sure. th- and that happened because we used a lot of those same systems and we just brought it over into this coffee mm-hmm. and asked ourselves, you know, um, how do we get it into a ballpark? 
turn around, put it on the cupping mm-hmm. table, and then analyze what's on the cupping table, and then turn around and make um, uh, very educated and reasonable changes yep. because we also we're also working with a very limited green. Yep. And so the the end client Onyx had to receive yep. the amount that they needed, so we couldn't, you know, so there there's we couldn't over roast for mm-hmm. dialin. Yeah. So a lot of these things you kind of have to approach strategically. And a lot of it is like simply just over the last three years, you learn a thing yeah. or two. <laughs> yeah. And I, th- I think one of the things that I've learned is because I definitely have more experience working behind the bar than roasting. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, even though like, man, we've roasted well over a thousand batches. Yeah. So we have a good amount of data that we can um, look back to, you know, process even tweak even some of the older roasts that we'll look back and be like, oh, remember when we used to do this and how we switch our system to do this? Yes. This is why. Um, so that why has really impacted how we do new mm-hmm. coffees. Uh, it's very similar to folks who, like myself, are very familiar with dialing and espresso. Um, what happens when you get you know two pounds of gesha that you're pulling on espresso and that is the only amount of that coffee you have? You have to work with very little. You have to be strategic with how you change your grind size. You basically, as soon as you put that coffee in the hopper, you want to make sure you're in the range. And what are the questions that you're asking? Okay, Panama, right? You know some things about Panamanian coffees. Where do they land on your grinder? You know, you want to get it in the ballpark. Then Geshas, you know something like, oh, you need to, for this roast level, you need to target this time. So you're asking those kind of questions, but then the end result is, you're not necessarily dialing in because you want to pull out more mango. You're dialing in whether the, uh, the shot is set not too sour, not bitter for balance. Mm-hmm. Similar in the roast, I believe. Yeah. At least uh, as I was processing, I was thinking there's a lot of crossover similarities here. Even though we don't know like what the full flavors of this coffee mm-hmm. are or were, we're dialing in to what do we know, know about a good roast? Um, what does baked mean? You know, yeah. what, I mean? what does a underdeveloped coffee taste like? Mm-hmm. What does a overdeveloped coffee taste like? What's a properly developed coffee taste like? Yeah. So when we're dialing in, uh, as we're roasting and cupping, in the cupping process, we're we're asking those questions, and that's where we come to the conclusion: okay, this coffee is fairly balanced. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think, especially when you're you know talking about the having limited volume mm-hmm. of this coffee you really need to use the that kind of expertise to just get it within a ballpark mm-hmm. and almost thinking ahead in terms of you know what you said about like dialing in espresso and with like a limited amount of geisha you're really just thinking like okay what have what has worked how do i navigate this what can be tweaked and the difficulty is also when there's curveballs yeah like you get a geisha and somehow you know it's just choking the brew and you're like yeah. what the heck this never happens or you know you get a coffee and it's crashing after first crack ridiculously crashing mm-hmm. and you're not getting to your end temp or it's not progressing through the roast as you'd like mm-hmm. because it's just plummeting your your ror is plummeting that yeah. is and you don't have enough energy and so those things you kind of have to you know in your dial in you kind of have to pull out all the tricks of the trade yep. that you know to be able to deal with those one off yep. experiences that can actually occur and you don't actually know it until you until the greens in the roaster yeah, really a hundred percent yeah and that's what makes it also exciting uh makes it tricky makes it exhilarating um and gives you all of those feelings of like man experiencing new coffees i think a, a lot of the times projects like this is like what really gets me stoked to be part of and for sure to be able to execute that uh problem solve on the fly uh, I, I think in one of the roasts, you pulled out a random trick. You're in the middle of the roast. We're like, oh, shoot, this coffee is reacting this way to those changes. Um, we know that we usually do this to execute that. And I'm like, dang, it worked like on the fly. And we cupped it and it became part of our plan for roasting this coffee. And I think those kind of moments are big moments in knowing like, okay, how do you how do you manage a new coffee? How do you manage a new roast? And how do you stick to basically your style and preference of roasting? Yeah, I think 
past experiences are such a big um, part of attacking, you know, so, you know, uh, a challenge like this. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, um, yeah, this kind of just puts all your skills to the test. Because you're like, man, limited on time, limited on green, limited on a bunch of these things. And it's for somebody else. Yep. You really have to be on your A game. And if you're just, if you just haven't put in the reps, if you haven't put in the time, it yeah. is what it is, you know? Totally. And that's the intimidating thing. But as we wrap up this episode, give the folks like, what's a one tip, one or two, but one mm -hmm. tip, you know, somebody just bought Geisha you know, they have a hundred pounds of it, very mm -hmm. limited quantity or, you know, whatever, what are they, what would you recommend them to do, um, in, in a moment like this? Yeah. Uh, don't try to do something new. <laughs> stick yeah. to, stick to what you know, you know, you, whether you bought this geisha or you were, um, offered to and asked to roast, there is some form of dependability within that like why did you risk buying this geisha that means you know something about roasting like hopefully this is not your first ever coffee that you're roasting so you already know that so trust that instinct um stick with what you know and don't try to change like oh you normally roast 10 pound batches you're gonna roast you know a two on mm -hmm. the same roaster like that might not be a good idea if you've never done that or if you have done that like make those decisions according to like what you've already done. And I think we've, you know, clearly said that, but that's the most important thing. Don't try to change all the variables, stick to a few that, you know, yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. There it is folks. You guys have heard <laughs> it from the man, the myth, the legend, Sergey Kotrovsky. Hey. That's excellent. Well, um, hopefully this was encouraging. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, but yeah, folks, thank you so much for listening. If you're listening to this, you know, this weekend, Thank you so much. That is such a such a big honor to be part of, you know, your holiday weekend that you even took time to just, yeah. you know, play this podcast yeah. through whether that's through your car speakers, yeah. through your AirPods. Maybe you're like playing this on, you know, during dinner with your family. Oh, that'd be bold. That yeah, that's that'd be, that'd be wow. Yeah, wow. I, I just whoever like, whoever you are, yeah. <laughs> I I yeah. uh, I commend you yeah. for that. I mean, I just imagine someone just chilling on an airplane, you know, with their maybe uh, AirPods Pro and tray tables down. I just gotta tell you, if you're in the middle seat, put that phone with our little cover mirror coffee roast <laughs> warm up <laughs> sessions right on the middle of your screen in the middle of the tray table. Let your neighbors see. <laughs> Give them a nod. Maybe, maybe offer them an yeah. air bud. <laughs> yeah. like, Share like, the pod. Yeah. Hey, dude, they're talking about roasting geisha. You want in on this? <laughs> Have you ever roasted a geisha? Yeah. Yeah. All righty, yeah. folks. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. And once again, um, hopefully you guys have a splendid weekend. Restful, exciting, and good. Um, that being said, as always, friends, remember, reflect what's good. <laughs>